Hello and welcome to the Game Dev London Pass Test. I'm Anna, a game designer and today's host. And uh, I'm glad to be joined by my co-host, Oscar. Oscar, a lot of uh, people know you already, but do you want to give an introduction for those who don't? Hi, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm Oscar. I've been around in games forever. Um, I've been working on online games since 1998. Yeah, I'm that old. Uh, I've been working on games of service for a long, long time. I was a Unity evangelist at one point. Done some fun stuff with mobile, with PC, and with console. So uh, I have an opinion on everything. I'll let you decide if it's valid later. Well, today we're going to find out your opinion on player agency and choices in games. Uh, and to start off, uh, I kind of want to give our listeners a bit of like introduction to the concept in case they're not familiar. So uh, when you're like playing games or developing your own projects, what for you is player agency? How do you define that for your team? Well, that's, that's the fun bit, isn't it? It's uh, basically... Uh, I have control. I have autonomy. I am, um, you know, somebody who um, acts, and then there's a result, and I did that. So that that kind of, I think, that, to be honest, to me, that's really kind of the point of most games. The difference between a game and a puzzle. Uh, if you want to be really pedantic, like I often am, it's that I get to choose, and the things I do happen. That makes us you know, transition all, all the way away from like film uh, books. I cannot make an I can't have an impact on the result in a story normally. Choose your own adventures aside, although I'm not supposed to say choose your own adventure because that's trademark. Let's say choose your own path. Um, anyway, whether you choose one of those traditional methods or not, having some ability to have an effect on the outcome, I think that's really the crux of it. Yeah, I agree. Like I actually did a bit of uh, research during uni and like a very formal definition of that is a uh, player's ability to change the course of their experience, which is basically exactly what you're talking. And I feel like it's very important, especially like in games where you have those interactions, but like player agency isn't just being able to choose what you're doing, but also making those choices feel meaningful. Um, and it's really important for like, play autonomy and feeling of control. Uh, so I wanted to kind of talk about like, what is the distinction between just mere interaction and actual player choice? Um, do you have any good examples of where you felt that player agency? It be? does get a bit blurry in some places. So for example, one of my favorite things on the planet is something like Monument Valley and the, the you know, Dan and the team you know, behind that game are amazing and I absolutely applaud them. Um, but as I've been a, an obnoxious git about on many occasions, I don't see it as a game in the definition. When I'm talking about agency, it is a an amazing, immersive puzzle. But obviously I'm splitting ridiculous hairs at this point. Um, and it, and I, I, please don't hate me on me if you're a listener. I don't mean it in a bad way. I'm just using it as an illustration. In Monument Valley, I have to find the place to click to move the thing forward. And there's, you know, there's certain set, set, uh, elements of path. Now, I am discovering a bunch of things. And that you could argue there's a little bit of agency in my act of discovery. But actually, I think if you compare that to, say, I don't know, uh, a first-person shooter world, like an Uncharted, where I'm exploring a world around me and I can, I've got to work out the puzzles for myself and in which order I get to those things and how I find things in the world, whether I find things in the world, do I have more agency? Well, actually, that's an interesting question because do I actually have more agency or is it just that the illusion of the world I'm in presents the per perception of agency? And that's where I come back to the kind of why it's a convoluted kind of really de in depth discussion. I like there to be choices. I like there to be outcome. But maybe the perception of that choice is more important than the reality of it in some cases. That's, that's, really, that's interesting really interesting because, because uh, uh, like, like, like the scholars, scholars and like scientists and stuff define, define agency, agency in terms of like, like theoretical, theoretical agency, agency uh, yeah. which, uh, which is, is uh, just, a just a selection, selection of choices. choices. So, so you can, you can present, present the player with like five, five different, different buttons, buttons or five, five different, different paths, paths. And, and uh, uh, just, the just the fact that you have, have them in game, game this is theoretical agency. But a lot of people argue that it's not enough to just give a player choice. It's very important for them to feel like they have a choice. And this is actually completely different concepts. And like 
like, like you, need you need to really, to really work, work on that on perceived that agency, agency uh, to, uh, to your achieve player, player agency, agency as a whole. As a whole. And I'll give you uh, my, one of my favourite examples of that is uh, we we talked about this earlier was Witcher Three. So there's a couple of places I think where there is actual agency, but it's really just a very small part of the story. The vast majority of Witcher Three, I'm presented with three choices in dialogue in general, and yes, I could encounter any situation in any order and doesn't really matter but what matters is i get these three choices and i'm i, I can't remember if it's the top choice is always the correct choice the thing that will move the story forward the other two choices are basically more information but i feel like i've got agency um, and so i think that to me is one of the most direct examples of that theoretical agency the presentation the agency i have isn't the agency of the game the agency I have is how much I care about the story. And in that case, although I normally don't read anything, I actually read much, much more in The Witcher than I do in almost everything else. Because it was a theoretical agency. But what like, what made you feel in The Witcher that you had agency? Is it just purely that you cared about the story? Because a lot of games have that, where you have the choice with an icon that will tell you that it will progress and choices for more information. It's the way they disguised it. It, it, when, and t it didn't tell you overtly. You discovered it as you played. Uh, it was the first time I'd encountered that, uh, that subtlety where it was like, here's the thing and then here's the extra info as opposed to... Here is the dialogue. I'm having a dialogue. I expected the routine of dialogue I'd expect in other games like it. But instead, I got this thing that w that actually mattered other information. If that makes sense. So I, I kind of was self-delusional about it. But I still had a sense of um, direction because it's an open world, because I could actually choose to encounter things in any order. Uh, quite often I'd be killed because I went to the wrong place at the wrong time but that's the game. Um, it's stuff like that that I think made the difference. I think for me, like, I love the Witcher games. I feel like that's the game where, like, in terms of narrative, that felt like the most autonomous one, uh, where, but for me, it was not about those choices where you're getting more information, but about making a choice and not knowing that it's going to lead to some like outcome further into the game, you can kind of like predict what it's going to be or which ones are going to be important, but you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to happen. And that kind of like mystery behind that made it feel real because you are making choices based on your knowledge right now and you don't know how it's going to affect your life in the future. And that's pretty much how life is. And it was well written and so... It didn't just fall into cliches all of the time. Obviously, it has enough cliche to make you feel like you're somewhere you understand. Um, but it definitely it definitely felt like you were immersed in a world that was cruel, that was mean, but was fun. So, uh, interestingly, we, I've just <laughs> noticed our names are appearing on the wrong faces at the moment. <laughs> oh, well, such is well, life. People will huh? figure it out. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um... Continuing talking about the witch, actually, like, um, and what, like, how do we make choices feel uh, meaningful in games? Because, like, you can have a, like, love mass effect, but, like, the, in some games, like Mass Effect, where you have, like, a path of a character, where you can be, the, like, a good or a more, a less good character, uh, you, you still like have that sense of choices, but you're kind of on a predetermined path. So if you decided to play like a good character, you always know what choices um, to make if you decided to play bad characters, other set of choices. Uh, and for me personally, it doesn't feel as impactful as in The Witcher, where every choice you make is going to have, it's more like, choosing less of the evil, uh, like it was always said in the books and stuff. Uh, would you agree that that also makes the choices like feel more impactful? Yeah, it does. And uh, I think the bottom line is um, it's, it's about how the game has been designed and, and reflects the experience of, of the story. So, for example, um, the uh, Mass Effect games, um, I can choose to be good or evil. And actually, the combination of those choices actually simply increases my range of options. Um, 
you know, arguably. Uh, I'm always playing Paragon because I'm, well, I'm a ridiculous fool. Uh, but I know a lot of people just like to go around and do the, do the bad guy thing, and, and that's okay. Um, I think finding those different choices. I suppose the things that I find, I find problematic, though, are where that perception of choice is taken away from you. So I bore endlessly about um, one of my favourite games, which I also is one of my most hated games in equal measure, uh, and it's The Last of Us, which is an amazing game, and one of the best games I've ever made, I'm sure. Don't get me wrong. But there's a point in that, and I won't I won't bore those people. I know it's a bit, bit old in the tooth to worry about spoilers, but I won't spoil it. But there is a particular point where the illusion of autonomy is completely stripped from you. And for me, that was a gut punch. That was like, oh, well, oh, 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 this, this character I thought I was playing goes and does something I personally think was hateful. Uh, you know, I mean, hateful is probably too strong a word, but I had a visceral frustration with it. And it destroyed my sense of immersion. It destroyed my sense of autonomy. And it ruined the game for me. Um, and it just... I mean, there are a couple of other minor things that I won't bore you with, but um, but that's the kind of issue. Another example I get frustrated with is it, one of the things that happens a lot in platform games. I know lots of people love platform games. Again, I'm going to get hated for this. I'm sorry for all those of you who love platform games. But there's a certain designer uh, style for those games where if I don't time my jump to the right height and timing and positioning exactly to the millisecond of the millimeter or pixel i die so actually a lot of platform games are simply me mimicking what the guy who designed it could do ignoring what i can do now as someone who has a little bit of dyspraxia I mean, i've never been diagnosed but i've definitely had a an issue with my hand-eye coordination that means i'm slightly off kilter um i can't play those games I just can't. So you, as Miss Designer, Mr. Designer, whoever you are, um, you've made it so I can't play your game. And I that takes away the autonomy. That takes away my ability to feel part of the immersion. It takes. So it's, it's not just about story is what I'm trying to get across. It can also be about the mechanics itself. And, and again, I'm going to go back to The Last of Us. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to give the other example. If I stealth kill someone in last of us i get um uh, i don't get anything i get no ammo if i shoot them though turns out they had ammo all the time the same character that i walked past when i got killed and then i played again when i stealth killed them i got nothing when i shot them i got ammo well, that didn't make sense to me you just made my yeah. job harder to play you've taken away my choice in play yeah, it, it, like it, it takes the perspe perception of the like, even though you have the perception of the choice, it's like it's not meaningful. Uh, therefore, there is no agency because there is always a path that is more lucrative and you're going to be maximizing to get all the rewards rather than actually making choices. So instead of like trying to figure out what, how, what the character you want to play or like what is your play style, you're just going to be doing whatever the re game rewards you for, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And and it's you're being rewarded to do the criteria set by the designer rather than the ambition you have as a player. If that makes sense. Yeah. But don't get me wrong. I, I mean, like I say, I'm having a go at amazing games and I'm not meaning that I could do better necessarily. It's more I'm, I'm trying to use them as an illustration of the difficulties that any designer faces when they're looking at a game. You know, uh, you're going to make choices and some of those choices are not going to work with some players. There are players out there who love to be able to tr challenge themselves to get that millisecond pixel level bounce. I get it. I can't do it, but I get why. And we have to make a call when we're making designing any games because we have we have limited systems. We have to have limited systems. Otherwise, we'll take forever creating AI which we could probably put better to use. Whereas instead, if we think about the experience that we want to create and we craft that with some level of sense of choice, then we can get a much better experience. 
Absolutely, like the scope is always the issue. But you can't, as a designer, you can't criticize anything without actually proposing a solution. So, interestingly, what uh, you're saying about platformer games, like you, uh, some would argue that is actually like the whole point of the platform game to time it. But um, how would like if you had a blue sky scope for it, like unlimited resources, what kind of things would you look at to? give players that sense of agency even when it's to do with like com competence skills basically i mean it, the competence skills is a difficult one i think mean, generally i think the let's think of a good one motorstorm for example had a really interesting mechanism for playing with different vehicles so rather than trying to balance out a motorbike versus a giant lorry versus a kind of beach buggy or whatever else whatever vehicle you had they had paths that were better suited to those vehicles so the motorbike could get past the others because they could take these shortcuts that the lorries couldn't take but the lorry was hit by something who cared the bike gets hit by something you really notice it and and to me that's the that's the kind of thinking that i appreciate uh i mean that studio were fantastic anyway but um you know what what is the equivalent i mean i said so some of the stuff that i think is really interesting is again it's trying to work out what game from most platform games i'm never going to be a huge fan of just because i know that's me and that's okay i don't have, not everybody has to love everything um but one of the things i thought was really interesting got me excited about with a particular platform game was a, a set of controls that were basically a slider so you couldn't go back but you could change the how fast you went so it was really interesting because you had this lever system, basically. So you could run and then you choose with jump still. But because you couldn't go backwards, you couldn't, you'd slow how fast you're going. But you, actually, you know, could you slow? Yeah, you could slow. But you want to get past things, you have to get enough momentum. So you had this slider. Just the change of interface changed the way of looking at it, changed the nature of the skill set. So it gave the other options. Um, other ways of doing it are things like boosters and power-ups. Other ways of doing it are, are looking at um, unlocking kind of abilities. Because some some people, like me, are rubbish at the jumping. Give them another option about how to s resolve the level. Yeah, give them some other design mechanism that allows them a little bit like the motor thing. Gives, just gives them another choice. So it's not just a case of I'm bashing my head against a brick wall over the single problem. Help me find a different way to solve the problem that may be more inclined to my uh, skill set. Because I don't have to get 100% in the smallest possible time. I, do, I still want to play the game. But I don't expect to be elite. And when you design around the only the elites can finish, I think that's the problem. When you design in so that elites can complete faster and it's meaningful that it's faster... And it's meaningful that they take the shortest possible route, the most difficult path. That's interesting. Reward that. Reward doing it better than you should should be able to do. But make it possible to somebody still enjoy themselves, even if they're not an elite. Is is I suppose that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, I I, I think absolutely. Like um, I think I haven't played that game, but I've seen a lot about it. Celeste, where you have a lot of accessibility options to like make it slower and like in um for the horizon five as well like it is a very skill-based game and uh in five we introduced like a um slider so you could actually decrease the speed of your game to make the car feel more controllable even on higher speeds and guess like those kind of accessibility options will uh allow players of different skill sets uh, to complete it but also giving players different paths i think is like the most powerful um, way of doing it. What I'm trying to get across though is it's not just about making it accessible, which is a good thing separately. It's rewarding people who go beyond the accessible intrinsically. Now, one of the classic problems I have is um, uh, first person shooters. Okay, so back in the day, uh, back in the Quake days, there was a mod by a guy called Mark Smith uh, who I ended up working with at NVIDIA. Um, it was our favorite mod. Um, and Mark did this thing, which, uh, weapon of choice basically meant that if I killed you in Quake, I couldn't use a rocket launcher. If I did it again, I wouldn't be able to use a lightning gun. If I did it again, I'm down to a shotgun. Eventually, I get down to an axe. 
but if you kill me, then I get my weapon back. So, you know, that's a nice little balancing thing. So what happened was you had a whole bunch of newbies playing the game with rocket launchers being chased by maniacs who were experts with axes. Everybody had fun. Now, it wouldn't be the only mod you play, but as a way of playing with more people, it leveled the playing field because it made things for the people who were good harder, therefore more fun, and for the people who weren't good yet, easier, so they could grow into the skills required for the game. I don't think we see that mindset anywhere near enough exploited. Yeah, but I think it's because this is incredibly hard to actually do from the design perspective, like balancing something to make the uh, it rewarding well, it's, it's incredibly better. hard to do it perfectly. Absolutely. You don't have to do it perfectly. You just have to do it enough so it's a little bit easier. You feel like you have a fighting chance. Again, we're back to perception of change. So was were, were people who were newbies killed any less often when they were chasing, being chased by people with axes? Actually, basically no. no. Did it matter? No, because they felt they had a fighting chance. And I think that, again, I kind of keep coming back to this. I think perception is the key here. I think it's understanding how the game is perceived to the audience that's not you. Do you have any, like when you're designing game, do you have any kind of uh, criteria or rules or design principles to make sure that there is a perception of choice? It, it, it varies. I mean, like I say, normally when I'm brought in, it's trying to fix a broken game. So, um, uh, I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, just that's a summary of, of the you know, kind of problem. So I'm looking at things like retention and stuff like that rather than the sort of specific mechanics generally. But yeah, I mean, I do try to think about it. Um, well, again, what I try to think about is what does it feel like to be the user? What are the playable elements? And, and matchmaking, I mean, this idea of how could you add a handicap uh, to make it so it's more accessible so that a single player can play with more people. There's a principle called Swiss brackets, basically, that um, you have a sort of I want you to play not against, you know, the, the, the smaller and smaller subset of elite players. I want elite players to be able to play successfully with a larger audience who are not as elite as them and still have everybody else play and feel good. Um, golf is a really good example of how this works. Now, again, golf handicaps are very, very difficult to get right. But what is a golf handicap? A golf handicap says that on average you're going to get your ball in X number of shots above par. So if I have a handicap of two, that means whatever the course is par is, say the par of the course, so the number of shots to hit 18 holes is, uh, I don't know, what, three times 18, whatever, 23, anyway, my brain can't work things out. Um, say it's 60, anyway. Um, so let's say it's, uh, the course is a par of 60, uh, and I've got a handicap of two, that means I should complete that course in 62 and now if you've got a handicap of 28 then you can complete that score in 88 and you know if, if say, say you do it in 87 and I've done it in 62 you've won that's easy it's not brilliant maths it's not brilliant like clever it's not super super like analysis it's just a on average I will complete a course in this amount therefore my par is x and i think that kind of simplistic approach is not a bad benchmark for thinking about how do i make sure everybody has a good game here yeah, yeah makes, sense. makes sense so, so it's, it's basically, basically like setting, setting the score per player, player kind, of kind of thing i mean that's that's the version there the other, another example is timing so for example if you've got a, a racing game uh, I want to look at what is my average um, target. Now, if I if I um, playing a racing game and I base it all on how much how fast I can go driving that particular vehicle, that's fine. But actually, wouldn't it be better to see if I, how much I change and improve my average time as opposed to my fastest time? Or what if I see if I can improve my um, best time only or my best this week only? And I think, you know, things like that where 
it's not about necessarily about me versus your absolute time but maybe it's me my average time rate of change against your average time rate of change because then we're actually seeing how relatively we're performing so you could put people in ranks based on the actual time but then when they race together you base it on their rate of change of time that's interesting i've never actually seen games do that yeah, uh, like when they are. i've never seen it either uh, but i'm just thinking this is the sort of logic that we should we should consider or we could consider uh, i would be actually curious to try and design something where the uh, uh, like win is defined by how much you're improving rather than the, your absolute score. That would be challenging. Um, it, it's a crazy idea. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of good reasons not to do it. <laughs> like the moment we'll start uh, designing, there will be like, that's why no one does it. Okay, goodbye. Yeah. Well, it's more about communicating to the player how they're doing. Because if you beat me, you want to know that you beat me. And that's good enough, isn't it? But actually what's interesting is how much you beat me by compared to how much you're improving. I think that's a much more interesting thing to play with from a statistical point of view. The question is, can you make it a more interesting thing from a player experience point of view? Yeah, that's, uh, I guess that would be a challenge. <laughs> Well, maybe next time you can present us a pitch for that idea. Uh, another thing that, uh, like, for me, makes it like player agency is really strong. Like games like Divinity, uh, which allows you to literally like kill anyone and do whatever. Like, there are so many paths. Uh, to completing a quest, which are all valid in its own way. Uh, what do you think about that kind of approaches? Do you think games should kind of like strive to do that or is it wasteful in terms of like scope and resources? Um, I think it can be amazing. Uh, I remember the Deus Ex always used to have three paths. You can either go through your skill or through your your charm, your communication, or through um, physical yeah, combat. Um, and there was always these three paths throughout, and I think that felt really nice, particularly when you switched which one you were doing. The, the trouble with it is um, you often end up having these three paths, and then a, a single player won't have a reason to switch lanes, so they'll specialise only in the one that they're doing well in. And I think that takes away the texture of the experience. And, and again, back to autonomy, I think part of this meaningfulness is making those choices I'm making them part of a narrative. So I don't just make the choice because I happen to be maxing my combat skill. Yeah, for example, what if you made it so in order to... It's not serious, by the way. I'm just throwing this out there as another silly idea. <laughs> what if improving combat skill was dependent on me improving my communication? If I, if I had to win communication combats to get strength for combat skill... That would be interesting. Well, what if I had to um, I had to basically win puzzle pro projects in order to increase my communication skills? And combat would increase my puzzle solving skill. N not serious, but imagine that roller coaster. Now, in order to be really good at anything, I've got to do something else. And it may not be quite right from a kind of core mechanics, but I'm sure there must be some abstract level that we could do something really interesting where we can actually get uh, a real tension. You know, this is what I love, a dilemma-based tension, which allows you to really feel autonomy. You know, in order to do this, I have to make a choice. And the choice has a compromise, a compromise between A or B, or maybe A, B and C. And those compromise choices lead me into a direction which allows me to explore the game's narrative independent of the story that was written, if that makes sense. So I'm creating my own story of my own character's journey at the same time as progressing the world story as we move through. And I think that's a really interesting sense of, of, of um, you know, uh, compelling uh, engagement, autonomy. What was the game? There was a, there was a Diablo-like game, Dungeon Siege or something, I can't remember what it was, where uh, you could 
specialise in strength and be a, a fighter, specialise in magic and be a wizard, specialise in archery and be a thief or whatever it was. Um, but actually you could do all three. And if you did all three, your character was way weaker. But it was more fun, I felt, because I, there were more things I could play with. Yeah, it does. But like, uh, how, how did they make it? How did they encourage you to specialize in all three if your character is weaker? Like this, I like most players uh, lock into like one pass, especially in modern games, not because they can't change it, but because in terms of gameplay, it's a more um, kind of like logical approach because you will be strong if you just pick one. Uh, how did that game encourage but, you? But, but that game failed to encourage. That's one of its biggest flaws. That it didn't encourage you to do all three. In fact, you could min max by picking one, and that kind of broke the point of having the choice between all three. Uh, so that I think is an issue. I think other games have managed to kind of give you a sense of it. Again, it comes down to if you can't access all of the puzzles because you're only doing some of them, you. you you're you're, mi you're missing out if you max on one only, um, and that, but how you communicate that you're missing out and don't make that resentful, that, that's more challenging. I mean, with Skyrim, uh, it's a difficult one because you can kind of min max everything simultaneously almost. Uh, it gets definitely to the point beyond which there's any point in worrying. Oh, there's a monster. It's dead. Move on. Um, so I think I think this is a, this is a fertile ground for exploration i mean another example i suppose is elden ring although i've still not played it i will do but i know it'll take over my life the fact that you can go and do all the extra missions around the, you know the side before you go to the bosses to build up your skill and you could essentially grind it till you're essentially impossible to beat before you even start the bosses that's an interesting choice now is it solving the problem? No, but it does highlight this min-max problem, which is, do we do? You know, players will sometimes choose to grind the hell out of something because it makes their life easier elsewhere. Um, so we have to make it so that we can, we're not just encouraging them just from the pure maths of the game, but actually that they get something for it. That's why I like. Um, I'd like to see get more games have narrative arcs that take place regardless of whether you engage with them or not you know why, why don't we have a timeline where the cities evolve and which faction that they support is going to depend on what actions you took whether you saved the princess or the prince or the frog or whatever else it might be shouldn't that affect the faction that that person belongs to and negatively affect the faction that they were against and those two things affecting the world seems kind of cool to me uh, I'm sure there were games that used to do lots of that. Um, it, it was even a uh, there was a choose your you know what was it? It's, it's kind of a convention-based play-by-mail game we used to play called On Guard, uh, a big um, sort of tabletop game convention. So you put your orders in, and somebody would work out on a massive spreadsheet how you know um, Three Musketeers style France would evolve, and somebody would become you know. Ministry of War, somebody would become, you know, would have an affair with the mistress of somebody or else, and there'd be a duel and all sorts of weird things like that. But the point was, it was all of our actions combined that painted a picture of the world. Uh, but we don't see that kind of game happening. Yeah, and I think it's actually really important to, like, this is kind of like the essential uh, play agency where your actions actually influence how the world develops. Precisely, and that I think I, I miss some of that because, with in the tabletop era, we did that. You know, back in the you know the the early nineties and the, you know late eighties, there were games like this that were happening all the time. Um, but they were happening behind the scenes. They were using play by mail techniques. Um, we I remember running um, a pa well, I, w I was playing in a paranoia game in the middle of UK Gen Con, which is a UK's version of the american conference that used to exist in the 90s and so you would have hidden on your person an id tag showing the color that you were in paranoia and essentially if you were wearing the wrong colors to do with the color you were you could get 
shot in game by somebody else and all of some, the rules of the game but it was all because we had this sense of what was happening in the real world what was happening in the game world and we were all submitting orders about what we wanted to do and, and this combination of real person personal narrative literally bumping into somebody um, would make a difference um, anyway that, that to me is the ultimate kind of like player agency where I actually am me playing this game and you are actually you in playing this game and we have a real world encounter on top of this layer of like the imagination if that makes sense yeah unfortunately with like computer games and consoles it's much more difficult to do because like yeah in the real life there are like there is no code code that only can provide you so many choices you can literally do whatever that's why i love dnd where like the you can do whatever you want as long as it's within the rules of the system precisely and that that to me is the crux of it it's like what i love about tabletop games that's why i love dming is that the world is mine although i may i might be taking matt mercer's world uh, um with lots of liberties um it's only because i'm lazy and i don't want to have to prep um so i improvise everything literally improvise everything um and and we can't do that with computers at the moment I think there are some uh, various attempts with AI, which we might get there at some point. Um, I'm not too sure if it'd be the same or different. It'd be interesting to see how that works out. Where's Demis's number? Yeah, I, would, <laughs> I would be very curious to see games which allow you the same kind of freedom as D&D. &D. Um, another interesting topic that I wanted to kind of explore. Um, do you have any examples of games where they took away the player agency and it felt satisfying and made sense? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think they, they, they... I'm trying to think what exactly. I mean, obviously, there are things like um, uh, Journey, uh, which there is very little actual agency in practice. Um, but when you're kind of skiing down the mountainside in the middle of winter it's a beautiful experience and it's the the use of music it's the use of motion it's the artistic style uh, and you're you're surrendering to the game and i think that's a very different type of experience yes i can control whether i'm going left or right there are some elements of choice that i have to make but in general i'm i'm surrendering myself to the game i would argue flower again similar um uh, but I think there are lots of games that do this. I mean, if anything, too many games do this. Uh, you know, so it's not it's not a deceit. I think in in Journey that you're following the path. I don't think there's like a pretense that you're you have autonomy. Um, whereas something like Uncharted of this world, or even The Last of Us, um, I definitely feel like I am the person. You know, Nathan is a, a cipher through which I play although that kind of changes when we get to the, the last one because we actually see more of him come through um, but it, does that mean that it's less or more of autonomy I, I honestly couldn't tell you I think it's tricky I just find it really hard to come up with really good examples where the autonomy is taken away and it's good but it happens a lot um, where it's not so good or it ha happens in a way where I still am left with a sense of perceived autonomy, and I'm okay with that. I think when you're left with left with perceived autonomy, when it was taken away, is like the perfect design at that point. But I've played a lot of games where they would take autonomy from you, and you would be like, "So all that I've done didn't matter at all." Uh, like I love uh, Devil May Cry, for instance, but the last one I was playing, like there is this. I think first combat that you're supposed to lose and i hate when games do that like there is no way of, maybe i'm just that bad in games and you actually could win and finish the game in five minutes but i'm pretty sure it was scripted for you to lose and in that case in this um, situation i don't understand why games allow you to even try because that kind of feels like it's ripped off from you like the player agents like you were trying but then it's like such a like down Side. And there's a few examples. I think it happens in Assassin's Creed at various points where you're in charge of the combat at first, and then halfway through it takes over, 
and then you lose, even though you were winning. Yeah. Or, you know, that that to me, it's almost like a betrayal. Um, I, I again, I understand why. Um, there is a there is a there is a point to that, but that is that is storytelling in games where we're trying to tell a story like a movie you know i mean there are so many other ways we could tell stories one of my favorite ones i've never seen in um computer games but a friend of mine who runs an amazing warhammer game um a role playing game tabletop role playing game uh what he does is he decides what's going to happen in each city at each date timestamp, happening in those cities regardless so when you get to the city things have happened depending on when you arrive and he acts like all those things have happened so when he interacts with you they can tell you what happened so the city feels alive and if i happen to get there an hour later or a day later or if i go and come back the things that were going to happen anyway happen and i think that gives you this really immersive sense even though it's not got any player agency to it it feels like the world has agency and that gives me that sense of deceit uh, the, the player has agency if that makes sense absolutely i think like I, it was actually not that difficult a famous last words uh, to like kind of replicate that in games but i do think like when the world lives without you and it doesn't like evol revolves around you actually gives you more sense of agency and immersion because at that point, you're making choice to engage or not engage. Like, do you go to this village or that village? The choice will actually matter. Whereas right now, if you go to this village, it's fine. You can come back to that village and have exactly the same experience as if you chose it first. A principle of having the ability to be able to watch, the, or as a designer, have this timeline. And then you can have effects on that timeline based on factions. So you can have effectively branching narratives applied to each of your main locations that aren't multiple like endless trees. They're just like shift here, shift there, shift here, shift there. And then any reaction you have that a player has in the world will be based on, well, what faction does that location align with? How are you aligned with that faction based on your actions to that group have you killed off members have you traded with them have you given them stuff have you saved members that will can shift that polarity of response and then it doesn't actually have to radically explode your choices it doesn't have to make your kind of available choice as long as we know what positive options are negative options and somewhere in between um, we can always make that work we don't have to basically destroy the world every time we have like a thousand different choices. We can just close branches, find a nice happy medium. So that's one of what I'm trying to talk about when I talk about agency. It's like, what is the happy medium where I can feel like I did something that matters, has a lasting effect in the world in some way, whether or not it actually changes anything in practice. I'll tell you another yeah. example. Another favourite example is the zombie one. Again, I come back to the last of us all the time. When you, you find yourself turning left because you, you're being chased by zombies. Why do you always let me turn left? And later you find out there was no right turn. Something about the lighting, something about rubble, something about you know move, movement of the zombies, whatever it is, audio effects. There's something really clever about this beautiful art that just makes me go left. This architectural UX that we see in games that retains my sense of autonomy but i believe i'm choosing left in practice there's no other option i am absolutely fascinated by level designers who can do that uh, because like a lot of games would just tell you to turn left and uh, that takes away the choice, the sense of autonomy. But when you're like running and you make the decision and level design makes you make the decision without realizing that they made you do it, it's like, wow, perfect. I had a similar, yeah. Uh, I had a similar uh, experience in a vampire game where like the opening sequence has exactly the same, like, you're running like under stress and you're turning but never getting lost and that's because of how level design works 
<laughs> same uh, but uh, we have time to improve uh, on this uh, note, uh, let's conclude our conversation about player choices. I think we had an amazing conversation. And um, do you have any last kind of thoughts or words? I think it comes down to what game you're making and who you're making it for. I think there's nothing wrong with having competitive games where highly skilled people can show off their proficiency. That's fantastic. I thoroughly applaud that. But uh, it's probably worth remembering that you know there are folks like me out there who love your games but just don't have the physical dexterity to do it uh and and, and maybe you know we, we're being excluded by you not giving us a chance to play the game uh, and i think all we we don't necessarily expect to have everything but just to be able to play would be nice especially if we've dumped out 70 dollars or whatever it might be for the privilege um but the other side of it is actually this layer of sense of autonomy doesn't have to be um draining it doesn't have to prevent uh you know that it doesn't exponentially increase the scope of the game it's just about giving that kind of sense of is there multiple ways of solving this within the systems i have in place is there a dilemma involved in this where the emotional decision is as important as the actual decision can you communicate that in a way where i feel like i'm making a choice even if there never was a choice in reality. And for example, being told, do you want to do left or right, and then discovering there's no right, that was a choice you made, and you discovered the blockage on the right. And that, and how you make that tension work for the game, that's about kind of understanding the feel and finding the fun, the stuff that we're supposed to do making games. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um... Great summary as well. Uh, thank you, Oscar, a lot for this episode. So that concludes our episodes uh, of the Game Dev London podcast. And I was your host, uh, Anna. You can find me online on our Discord channel. Big thank you to Oscar for being my guest today. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, oh, I, I just switch cameras so i'll go back to switching the camera so i can be found uh at my ridiculously hard to spell uh twitter handle at athanasius a-t-h-a-n-a-t-e-u-s um so i'm at athanasius i can also be google so just like oscar clark games and you'll find me uh and uh, i'm when i'm not doing this i'm uh, chief strategy officer at the living game publisher fundamentally games Fantastic. I wish I could be Googled like that. Uh, fantastic. Thanks to everyone uh, who tuned in and be sure to check out our gamedev.linden for the latest updates. Otherwise, we'll see you here next time, the same uh, next week, the same time. Bye.